welcome. Hello, Tracy. Thank Good you. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening to you too. Well, thank you for joining us. And um, I look forward to hearing what you have to share with us tonight. And okay. I will let you um, share a little bit about yourself briefly in case people maybe don't know you. And then if you would like to get into um, your presentation, I'll pull that up then. Absolutely. And actually, I'm, I am going to share a, a bit about myself in my presentation okay. as well. well should I so pull it up? Yeah, the way that I've set it up. Um, but yes, uh, you have filled in beautifully uh, a very brief explanation about who I am and what I was up to. And um, I was in heavily involved in what is known as the New Age movement that is basically sweeping the globe and actually has been. We're going to go into the history here tonight okay. quite some time. Um, and uh, yeah, I spent 27 years doing, being involved in that, eight years earning uh, a living doing that. And mm. so uh, it's very important to me, and I believe very strongly that God has taken that and is taking that so that I can help educate and inform others because it's sneaky and it's evil and it's deceptive and it is uh, making its way and has been for quite again for quite some time into our church into our Christian church. Okay well wonderful thank you Please. and I will uh, bring up your um, my presentation presentation <laughs> here yes That's and great. I will let you have a go thanks so much and look forward to what you have to share. Okay, thank you very much, Tracy, for that nice introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, I've got a little talk here that I'd, I'd like to expand on tonight. Um, I am calling it Love, Light, and Lies, Discerning New Age Occult Practices in the Church. And this is just a little how-to for believers. So, excuse me, I seem to have gotten a bit of an itchy nose here. Um, I know that there are probably some of you have heard a number of my talks before. We're going to go in a little different direction. It's all the same topic, but I am going to answer four questions tonight. They are, what is the New Age movement? Um, what could possibly be its purpose and its practices? I'm going to talk about who I am and why I am qualified uh, to speak about the New Age. Um, how can Christians discern what is new age and how do we do battle with the new age in our churches? So question number one, what is the new age movement? What are its practices, its purpose? Well, the new age movement has been for some time and currently is in even a greater way, a worldwide network of, um, of groups in every country and every place literally on the planet with tens of thousands and likely at this point in time, many, many more than that number participating in it as organizations. There is this basis of uni unity in diversity um, and this is all meant to usher in what we are hearing and understand in terms of the world and the way the world is speaking right now, the new world order. So there may be people who don't get that there's actually a connection between the things that you are seeing in the news right now and the directions in which the world is being uh, moved with this collective effort um, towards what is spoken of uh, or termed a new world order. So the new age movement is very much an integral tool and a part of that. The new age movement operates on the basis of esoteric or uh, uh, knowledge that is only for a few very higher people and also occult teachings. Um, it also involves extensive political collusion and agreement amongst uh, the leaders of the movement, again, which at this point are, are many and all over the wor world. 
And furthermore, what is it? It is a movement that has successfully infiltrated every aspect of our lives, personal, professional, and religious. So the New Age movement includes uh, organizations in its, its worldwide network that teach things like mind control, holistic health, um, so even the natural foods and the health food, food uh, fads that were started to become big in the 60s and the 70s, those are all hooked in literally with the New Age movement. Esoteric philosophy, science, and politics. It also involves um, organizations that are dedicated to peace and goodwill. So you probably can call to mind a number of names of those sorts of organizations. Greenpeace would be one such organization. It's also involved in consumerism, uh, environmental uh, and nutritional uh, organizations and religious cults. So the New Age movement, the backbone of the New Age movement is Eastern mysticism and ancient occult practices. So we see those in scripture going back to Babylon. Uh, Eastern mysticism involves um, countries like India and China uh, and things like Buddhism and Hinduism. This is the backbone of the New Age movement. Um, also, it hinges around and very much um, pushes this notion of mystical experiences being very, very high, um, high level and very important and very sought after. Um, experiential religion, um, so basically meaning that re uh, religions that uh, have an emphasis on experience of the mystical and direct experience with psychic phenomenon. Now, uh, the what would be termed psychotechnologies, a pretty big word, um, uh, to induce altered states of consciousness that are involved in these mystical experiences and these um, direct experiences of psychic phenomenon. These include medita meditation and, and psychedelic drugs. And so an example of that, as I've put here, would be something like LSD. Probably most people would be familiar at least with the idea of that. And many more techniques and approaches that I'll be uh, talking more about as we go forward that promise to induce transformation which is a euphemism for progressively deeper levels of demonic influence. And I'm going to demonstrate that in this talk or address that in this talk. There's also this uh, belief, this hinging on this underlying foundational idea that God is a force to be manipulated and humans can become their own gods. This is a goal of this movement and come to a place where they can attain godhood. So we can see that this is not compatible with our beliefs in our God, our Father, and as followers of Jesus Christ. Now, the New Age movement, I'm going to dig into a little uh, bit of a history here. It, it actually is something that's been uh, not always termed, of course, the New Age movement, but um, it's been going on and on and coming on for thousands of years, basically. It got its start, its modern start, and by that I mean um, the way that we see it today. This started back in 1875, and it was spearheaded by a woman named Helena Blavatsky. And she created a society that was known as the Theosophical Society. And many, many uh, well-known people of the day, um, including like a gentleman like 
Thomas Edison, the, I think the inventor of the light bulb, um, high level uh, philosophers and authors. Um, I cannot remember. Nate, Nathaniel Hawthorne, I believe, was a part of this organization. Um, they got together and Helena Blavatsky was uh, in contact, as she explains it, with highly evolved spirit beings. And there was also this attitude and continues to this day, this attitude that everything else outside of them and this higher level uh, uh, connection with these spirit beings is basically common herd mentality. They also uh, worked with telepathy uh, and their inspiration they believed was drawn from spirits uh, and which are demons in to us. We, we know that that's who they are. And elementals, which are um, plant spirits and, and so things on that plant level. Um, they believed that they were actually receiving transmissions and wisdoms from plants, demonic messengers, uh, and then what I'm terming here demonic or, or demon manipulated writing, which is known in uh, New Age practices as automatic writing. It's where somebody just goes, goes uh, quiet, allows a demon literally to enter into them, and then begins to write um, usually without even knowing what they're doing or what they're writing. The demon is writing through them. So she was recording the messages in this way. They were also utilizing secret signs and words that they could recognize to help keep the information that they were trying to disseminate amongst themselves from what they termed to be hostile investigators. And so they were pressing the belief that all world religions have basic truths that transcend any perceived or literal differences between them. They also exhibited extreme hostility towards Christians and had a strong desire uh, and purpose towards eliminating Christianity altogether. They held high wisdom of uh, wisdom traditions and things of India. India became a hub place for this theosophical society and their offshoot groups. They were pushing the theory of evolution, the um, idea of spirit guides, people opening up to spirit guides, and that it was a high level thing to achieve illumination and enlightenment. Now, Helena passed away and the torch was eventually passed on to a woman named Alice Bailey. And this woman labeled herself a Christian. She had been married and divorced um, of, an, of an Episcopalian pastor. Alice had a, an extreme hatred for Christianity. She uh, grew up in a Christian family and had other Christian relatives. And um, whatever her experiences were there were clearly not good ones, um, which can happen for people in uh, legalistic families. Um, Christian drawing on that sort of uh, way of looking at Christianity and taking it out into the world but she did develop a, a great hatred for Christianity and developed a great loyalty to the cause of occult practices and Eastern mysticism. So out of her um, devotion, she did a lot to continue to move the, the new age forward. She wrote uh, uh, dozens of books that had very specific instructions from what she termed the masters. These books too were written by automatic writing and uh, channeling cult techniques. We're gonna be talking more about that. Um, they espoused the divinity of man. Uh, they talked about uh, reincarnation. They took attacks on God's word and spread the lies of the serpent. She also 
developed um, arcane schools and organizations that were entirely devoted to plotting um, through networks the coming new age to have that established. And she also started a publishing company in 1922 and she called it Lucifer Publishing. But then a few years later, she changed the name to Lucis. And so my question is, was Lucifer, uh, the name Lucifer too obvious perhaps? Now this group of people and uh, her, her successors who again were many and were devoted, too many to go into detail here, worked quietly on the side. They stayed low, kept things quiet, kept a very low profile until 1975 when the whole new age could be publicly disseminated by all available media. And this was to um, start a long-term mass indoctrination of the world. So these instructions that they had received and that she had received um, were carefully, carefully being played out and brought into the forefront to be able to start an in, a program of indoctrination. And also mass indoctrination of children through the public school system. And we all have questions <laughs> about the public school system and many of us for a long time. This helps us understand why those questions would be in our hearts and in our minds where our children are concerned and their educations. So if it were to have purpose and goals, um, the way that they would describe these were, would be to usher in a millennium of love and light. And that reminds me of 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen that Satan, it's no marvel, Satan disguises as an angel of light. Who doesn't want love and who doesn't want light? Also again, to establish a one world order, and uh, a new mandatory world religion. That was also part of the plan to eliminate believers in Jesus Christ and destroy true Christianity by infiltrating the churches and to unite all world religions. So the heavy emphasis on, well, and the, the whole emphasis on ecumenism, but eventually rolling this over into a mandatory world religion. Um, but the ecumenism, ecumenism doesn't include uh, those people that worship our, our Lord God Almighty. And ultimately, bottom line, to take the world for Satan. And also uh, very key to their purpose and goals, and this is really the only way that they can bring this about, is to deceive millions and millions into supporting projects that are designed to eventually strip them of their civil liberties and much of their property, uh, believers their faith in Christ, or keep people away altogether, people who don't know Christ yet, who are seeking and searching and just every day all over the world people, and um, to strip them of their everyday uh, lives. Um, so this is done through pulling at the heartstrings, pressing on love and light and unity and unity and diversity and peace and love and, and um, charities that can help other people. It really, this is all part of this new age movement. Um, even, I just made a note here, sincere New Age adherents, those who are maybe mildly interested to those like myself who deeply participated, are not aware of how evil and how deep this goes, and that they are servants of Satan. I had no idea until God opened my eyes. Now, I want to strongly recommend that if you're looking for a book to read, this is a good one. For me, it's a must read for Christians. It is called The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, The New Age Movement and Our Coming Age of Barbarism by author Constance Cumbie. 
Now she wrote and published that book. The book was published in 1983. Um, the beauty about the book now is it's a great read 40 years after she wrote this book with the intention to expose the new age. It is an unbelievably well-researched book. I do not agree with everything that Constance has to say, um, but that's okay because she's got a main drive here that is very, very important. Um, she is also, she was, uh, I, she's, she's aged now and isn't practicing anymore, but I believe she was a lawyer and she gave up her lawyer career, um, took time off so she could actually research and put this uh, together, alarmed at what she was starting to uh, understand was going on and also a, a professing Christian as well. So that book in PDF format, you can download at my website, clairvoyance to christ.com slash dangers, but there is a link there on the main page. So now the interesting thing too about the New Age movement, although everything comes around and always ends up being the same thing, is that furthering its cause as well is this notion known as humanism, which is hugely popular in the world today and has been for some time. Now the focus of humanism uh, it's is that the prime importance is attached to humans, the human rather than God. It involves self, 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 self validation, um, where we get to validate ourselves from our own impressions, our own feelings, self will. We're the drivers of our lives through our self will, self realization. We get to come and know so much about ourselves through our will, through our validation, through the projects and things that we take on. Terms like real self, true self, higher self are very much a part of, um, of uh, the teachings of humanism. It's all about expressing feelings. I say, I call it pathos over logos, emotion over logic, uh, emotion over the word, uh, very much about celebrating bodies, all the different kinds of bodies, um, which is wonderful. We all have great, wonderful, different bodies, but this is all about celebrating it, elevating it to something completely uh, off the map. And of course, now we know today too, it's about celebrating every possible uh, uh, gender, um, whatever. I mean, it, it, I can't even stay on top of all of that stuff, but I, you know, it's about the whole shebang doesn't matter. It's all good and all to be celebrated. There, and it's so very important in humanism to be in one's own truth, which means basically that what's true for you might not be true for me. Um, that truth is relative. It's malleable and fluid and not absolute. Again, in direct contravention, directly going against God the Father, God our creator, and his absolute truth. Then there are things like radiant self, discovering your radiant self, the, um, the center at the source of all consciousness. And there is absolutely no Jesus Christ. It's all antichrist and self. So a couple, one very important thing that is core to the New Age movement, it doesn't really matter what aspect of it that it is, it's learning how to calm and relax, to center um, yourself. Um, it's one of the most important processes of all the New Age tools that are out there. So to do this, Eastern techniques are taught and used so a person can sit still and quiet long enough to concentrate on focusing her attention inward. It's about going inward. Um, visualization, meditation techniques to help con uh, contact the source of all consciousness at their center. You can see this is all about going inside. It's all about self. It's about withdrawing from everything going inside, opening up the imagination, 
visualization through meditation techniques. And what this eventually leads to is contacting and meeting one's own higher self, experience of one's own divinity and self glory. Well, what? let's just see what God has to say about that. Isaiah 14, 14, I will be like the most high. Ezekiel 28, 2, this says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you have said, I am God, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not God, though you set your heart as the heart of God. That's what this is all about. Now, there was a pretty famous uh, New Ager back in the 70s, 80s time um, named John Randolph Price. And this is one of his quotes. He was very influential. This was one of his quotes. The truth of our being is that the higher self of each individual is the Christ. Oh boy. And he means all people. He is not just talking about or even talking at all about believers in Jesus Christ. He is talking about this thing known as the Christ consciousness that New Agers believe is available to every single human being. And when I was in the New Age, I knew other New Agers who channeled the Christ consciousness. It's just mind-blowing, super evil stuff. Okay, so hopefully that has helped give a foundation that we can step off now, learn a little bit more about me and my journey, um, and um, why I call this out and how we can do that. So who am I and why am I qualified to speak about the new age? Well, I was born into a family, lapsed Roman Catholic mother, Jehovah's Witness father, very odd combination. My grandmother was a devout Roman Catholic and she was the family matriarch. Um, I was baptized in a Roman Catholic church. We went to church every Sunday and pretty much for the thir first um, 18 years of my life. It was all about that, except my mother was pretty, um, she was vehement. She did not like it at all, but she acquiesced to my matriarchal grandmother. That meant I spent 13 years in Roman Catholic separate school, attending mass, sometimes daily, um, confession, going through the sacraments, totally uh, having it drilled into me that the Pope was infallible. Um, no Bible was ever opened in school. All the information came from priests and catechisms and everything in between. So I realized when I had left high school that the Bible that I had been told I had to buy and I spent money on it had never been opened. The Bible that I had to have to be in my school, uh, my Roman Catholic high school, had never been opened. Um, so at the end of high school, I left that all behind and I just stepped right off into the secular life and church and everything else like that. It was strictly weddings and funerals and that was that. Also as a child, I experienced a lot of supernatural phenomenon. I would have sleep paralysis, something called OBE precursors. There's this experience that can happen, a supernatural experience called an out-of-body experience. I would almost get there and then pull back. I saw, felt, and heard ghosts. And um, very prevalent for me was the seeing of visions, things I had nothing to do with creating. They would just happen to me. They would be in behind closed eyes. It happened all the time. Sometimes they were nice. Sometimes they were very scary. But the, for some reason, this was a, a normal thing for me uh, through my childhood. In grade four, there was a dabbling in my room, a Catholic high school, with the Ouija board. And also, grades four and five, I took elective class, and it was yoga. So I started uh, uh, doing yoga at that age. 
I reconnected with yoga when I got into my 20s by taking a class that actually was being held uh, and taught in the Christian church down the street. Now, I wasn't at all involved with the Christian church. I just knew there was a yoga class down there. So I went down and I took it. This, put, this set me on a track to practicing yoga regularly almost every day for, for a good number of years. And then in my late 20s, I met a woman who I would call my spiritual, my first spiritual mentor. There ended up being many. She was heavily involved with the new age and occult. And she introduced me to angel cards and astrology, intuition, energy healing, numerology, tarot, psychic readings, past life regression, mediumship, palmistry, which is palm readings. You name it, she did it and introduced me to it. I got hooked. I started studying. I started taking courses and classes. I would go to readers, get my cards read, get my palm read. I'd go to places where there were demonstrations of this, that, and the other thing. Um, I studied astrology. I uh, sat with various new age practitioners. And then I began doing um, tarot card readings, astrology, and psychic readings on my own. Now, in 1992, I had uh, taken a visit to a church known as a spiritualist church, and it's where conjuring of spirits of the dead are demonstrated. Coming home on the heels of that, I suffered a traumatic sp uh, spiritual attack. Uh, during that attack, the supernatural phenomenon that I experienced was demon spirits literally trying to get inside me at the base of my neck, demon spirits passing through me, um, demon spirits wrapping unseen arms around me. The temperature drops in my room were, uh, in my home and in my room were 20 degrees or more. And I was terrified. I didn't think I was going to survive the night to try and help me figure out what was going on. I sought guidance and answers. I needed help with this. But the problem was I went through uh, to seek answers from new age practitioners. And of course I was told that I had the gift of clairvoyance. That was what all those visions were about. That I also clearly had the ability to communicate with spirits and that the best way to deal with this was to develop those gifts and to join the new age. Heavy, heavy time. Um, quite a bit quieter than today, but ever so cool. Like if you could get a foothold in that kind of practice in the new age, that was considered to be very cool. So I said no way to the spirit communication because I knew full well what was going on that night during that traumatic attack. And um, I, but I continued with all the other practices. I continued with the clairvoyant readings and the psychic and the tarot and the astrology. And I did have intense supernatural attacks that continued at a rate of about six per year for the next, literally for the next 15 years. These would wake me up at night. They would keep me up for hours. They were very frightening. Um, and so basically in 2007, I did what I call, I gave in. I gave in to that realm and decided to begin to develop my spirit communication skills, something that I had pushed back for years and enter into mediumship development. I studied uh, all over North America. If there was a teacher I wanted to study under, I traveled to that place and I went and I would study with him or I would study with her. Um, much of my uh, development occurred in a demon-filled spiritualist, in demon-filled spiritualist churches. These churches where they conjure the spirits of the dead are demon-filled, and you feel it and know it and see it when you go into these places. And uh, also in a haunted demon village, um, demon-filled village in a place called Lilydale, New York. If you are interested in knowing anything more about that, simply uh, Google it and you'll find out about Lilydale, New York. I spent a lot of time in that village. And in 2011, I dropped everything else. I had been running a retail business and other businesses, and I just went, okay, that's it. I'm full on. I began my full-time career in the new age. 
as a clairvoyant, a psychic, doing mediumship readings, demonstrations, seances, haunted house clearings. I also did animal communication of both animals that are alive and animals that had passed on into the spirit realm. I was teaching, mentoring, blogging, podcasting, and writing books on the new age. And I spent eight years of my life earning my living this way. And then eventually, in the last few years, I added to that whole mix the regular use of plant, uh, plant medicines and um, psychedelics um, and did what, what are called plant medicine journeys. I also became involved and participated in shamanism and witchcraft. Um, one thing that is very important for people who are listening today to understand about anything, even the smallest thing uh, in the new age is that occult involvement always leaves you wanting to go deeper, wanting to do more, wanting more wisdom, wanting to find out more. It becomes an addiction. I'm going to take a sip. Okay. So again, central to every bit of occult training is the practice of meditation and visualization. And that involves everything, shamanism, witchcraft, doesn't matter, psychic, clairvoyant, mediumship, every single thing that you can think of that's involved in occult training and occult, this is your central practice. This opens the door to clairvoyance, which is basically being able to see the future, see the past, precognition, um, predicting the future events, seeing into the spirit world. It's a non-local perception, which means um, clairvoyance can have you seeing something that's happening on the other side of the world because it doesn't matter where you are and seeing visions and spirits. This opens the door to the demonic realm. So I spent 27 years of my life as an active clairvoyant student, teacher, and practitioner of the New Age occult. I can easily say I have been there and I have done that. I know firsthand the dangers, the evil, and the eternal damage. And as I say that, I choke up that it does to those who will not forsake and repent. So I speak about it. So I just want to quickly um, let you know what my, my journey to Jesus was uh, like, give you my brief testimony there. In July 2018, after seven years of practice, I was overwhelmed with a very strong, what I call incomprehensible urge to read the Bible. And so it was so strong, um, I just, I did. I started to read, it was hard, but I kept pushing through. I was surrounded only by other New Age practitioners and people who were interested in the New Age. I did not know another Christian. I did not go to any church. My journey was a very solitary journey and it was, I was alone with scripture. I, it was just, okay, I, I'll do this. By September of that year, I was convicted that my, my clairvoyant uh, activities and my active participation uh, in the occult was not okay, that I, I could see, I could identify it from scripture as sin. It was clear to me. But the battle keeps raging in my life. Satan keeps what I would say, upping the ante to keep me from Jesus. I'm bombarded daily with signs and symbols and things, um, little things, little supernatural things, etc., that are meant to tempt me to come back to the devil and turn me away from Christ. January of 2019, in the middle of one night, I have one of my major spiritual nighttime attacks. Only this time, for the very first time, um, because I'm getting to know Jesus in scripture, I call on Jesus. My attack stops within seconds as opposed to the hours that it would usually last. So I'm feeling myself drawn more and more by God to come to Jesus. I'm starting to wind down my clairvoyant career. I'm so convicted I stop scheduling appointments. I discontinue my courses and my mentoring. 
Of course, as a result of this, my income drops away. And then Satan really ups the ante. Um, I am approached three times, offered big money to do a series of weekend seances for a producer from Hollywood. I have to be in that part of the world at that time. Um, and um, had some connections and somebody put this man in touch with me and he wanted me to do these seances. And I, I was also um, told that I would be part of the production that he was trying to develop out of this. And the amount of money that was being offered was ridiculous. And I knew I could not, I could not do it. And so I said, no. Then in March of 2019, I experienced another one of my severe nighttime attacks. Again, I immediately called out to Jesus for help. And again, it immediately ended. Um, after a period of wakefulness that night and listening to scripture, I came to faith in Jesus. Um, I called out to him over and over again. I was converted and I was baptized by the Holy Spirit. And um, now I knew I was a believer and I am following Jesus Christ. And the other very interesting thing about this experience, as well as a number of other things, including uh, worrisome and um, ever-growing drug use, my clairvoyance was completely gone. These things completely fell away, never to, be, to come back after that night. So little journey into the wilderness, my faith was immediately tested uh, with nighttime supernatural experiences for about two weeks post my conversion. I called on Jesus, I was clear who I was following. I demonstrated that, talked to God, prayed. Once that passed, and praise God it did, I was completely free of the supernatural attacks that I had suffered for 27 years, never to have another one of these. I was, I, I am to this day um, blown away by that after having been tormented for so many years. My business was gone. I was only at a half income, which of course tested my marriage. After some serious testing on that, God allowed my marriage to stay intact. And he teaches, he teaches me and taught me through his word how to be a godly wife and submit to my own husband in order to show my honor for God um, my husband and I, our lives are blessed in so many ways. Um, my husband, he's not a believer, but he recognizes and reflects on this often. He sees the Holy Spirit. He sees the power of God at work in our lives. And he continues to see it at work in our lives. But at this point, I'm still not going to any church. I've only got a, the only uh, fellowship I've got is a long distance Christian woman friend. And I daily pray that God will lead me because I'm also aware that I need to have a water baptism, but I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. And I pray for him to lead me to water baptism in his time and in his way. It's a remarkable story. I won't go into it tonight, but I was water baptized October 2019. And I'm absolutely certain that was the baptism that my father in heaven led me to. Um, I go down a lot of Christian deception. When you don't have fellowship, you start to watch YouTube. There was that. God always kept me in these places long enough to learn and then would lead me away. And I would just, it would end. And I would just move to the next learning experience. I learned so much, so many doctrinal deceptions without sticking in any of them for too long. Praise God. All the Calvinism, Lordship, Salvation, Osas, every kind of dispensationalism, Hebrew roots, false Masonic teachers and preachers and more. Now, something that did happen for me was shortly after my conversion, not very long, like literally weeks, God revealed that the Trinity was not true. Um, and it, I, I, I was stunned by, by this, just, it, I just knew it. Um, so I mentioned it to my Christian friend. I kind of danced around it a little bit and I was abruptly told very quickly not to question the mystery. And then what I found was all fellowship along the way afterwards was contingent on Trinity, Triune God, etc. So I did fall into that because I did eventually go to church. Not that I fell into the Trinity, but I fell into the fellowship with people who believed that. It never was a thing for me. Um, but here's the 
wonderful news. God read me out of the Trinity in his word completely by April of this year, revealing he is one Lord. Jesus is his human Messiah, the Holy Spirit, his power, God's power sent through the risen Christ to believers. With that Trinity idol overcome, after three years of intense solitary study on my own, I am given the go to ministry. So today, my ministry, my website, Clairvoyance to Christ, as clearly that was, you know, a big part of my journey. So my ministry to New Age, occult, New Age occult practitioners is to challenge them to question and examine their beliefs, to encourage an awakening to a movement composed of and rooted in dangerous uh, satanic occult practices, and then share with them that the only way to serve God is through faith in Jesus Christ as he is revealed to us in scripture and bring them the gospel of the kingdom. So many people who are practicing in the new age, the way that I did, believe they are serving God and they think that they are serving God, the creator. Then they, it's all skewed and it's very confusing. I dearly hope that they can understand. And that is my, um, my work in, to, to them in my ministry also to believers in Jesus Christ, to help them discern and understand what the new age is and identify new age occult practices happening in the world and in the Christian churches and help believers become informed as to why they should mark, avoid, and call out new age practices in the church and in the lives of other believers that they might know. So question number three, then we come to how can Christians discern what is new age? So one of the things that I found interesting that was that once I began to attend a Christian church, um, my observation was that there seemed to be very little difference between practices going on in the church and practices in the world and in the new age. So the books that were being read for Bible study, instead of actually studying the Bible, I mean, I did attend a few churches where we did actually study the Bible. But some churches they were studying Richard Rohr books and, and all these, this, this ridiculous stuff that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. So this is just hopefully a little schematic that you'll be able to kind of put in front of your eyes, um, you know, remember it is what I mean. So basically identifiers of new age are, it's either East, and pagan, and this is really clear in scripture, <laughs> where we're not to go, or this other element that I was also bringing in, humanism. And all of that is, is idolatry. It just all is idolatry. Worship of the creation replaces worship of the creator. It contradicts God and comes between us and God. So this focus on East, this focus on self and humanism. So from scripture, Ezekiel 8, 16. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were about five and 20 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east. And they worshiped the sun towards the east. So not new age, Practices that are not showy like Wicca with massive wands and crystals or fortune telling. The new age sneaks into church looking less, quite a bit less threatening and obvious. So it makes it harder to discern for those who are not familiar with what it encompasses. It'll sneak in all kinds of ways, in devotionals, the way devotionals are worded, in prayers to angels, in Christian books that are not Christian at all. An example of that is Richard Rohr, a book called Jesus Calling, even personality tests and things like that. So this is an example of Richard Rohr. Franciscan friar and ecumenical teacher, Father Richard Rohr, bears witness to deep wisdom of Christian mysticism and traditions of action and contemplation. Founder of the Center for Action and Contemplation, Father Richard teaches how God's grace guides us to our birthright as beings made of divine love. 
and then he's the author of a number of books. If it, there's ever New Age words, that paragraph right there contains a whole bunch of them. So what I'm terming the softer side of the occult is easier to bring into the church. Um, it looks good. It seems harmless. It appears to be love and light, but it is a lie. Again, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So New Age practices in the church, we're going to go through a few. There's lots, but we're going to go through a few, and I'm going to demonstrate how and why they are a cult. Meditation. Many churches, that's where I began my meditation, my reconnect with meditation back in the 1980s. Lots of churches are stepping into this and have been for quite some time. This is what um, three uh, psalms in, in scripture say uh, about Christian God-approved meditation, Psalm 1-2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night, reflecting on God's law. Psalms 5-1. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Now, I love this because there's a component here of words that can be separated, but I'm going to suggest that there's a component there of words that is also about speaking in meditation to God and asking and seeking and, and querying and praying. Um, this happens again in Psalms 1914. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So it's important because quieting is so important for new age as a new age tool. So new age meditation involves centering, calming of energies, progressive relaxation techniques, squeezing muscles, letting them go, squeezing muscles, letting them go visualization, a lot of guided, uh, a lot of meditation ends up being guided meditation where somebody else, someone outside of you, a voice outside of you is telling you where you are and what you're seeing. And then you are to use your imagination to fill in this visualization key to new age and breathing techniques to become still and calm. So relaxing and centering is the primary tool used by New Age occult practitioners. This is being practiced in the church. Meditation, all forms of it, and there are various forms, we won't go into them today, but basically it's sit still, um, breathe, relax, go inside and visual. Is, is, um, it involves three similar occult phenomena the cultivation of altered states of consciousness, the eventual development of psychic powers. This is why it's a basic foundation for developing occult powers and the possibility of spirit possession. So without hesitation, I say meditation should not be in the church or in the life of a believer for any reason except sticking to Psalms 1, 2, 5, 4, and 19, 14 for our guidance and instruction on meditation and anywhere else in scripture that God tells us, God shows us how we are to meditate. So meditating other than God's way is, there's no other way to put this, experimenting with the occult. Clairvoyance, psychics, Medians, shamans, witches, and occult practitioners use meditation to acquire and develop psychic abilities. Meditation is a new age occult practice, the very nature and goals of which involve the probability of spiritistic, uh, which is demon spirits, involvement, not possibility on this one, probability. Meditation cannot be Christianized by bringing Jesus into it to try to, for example, I've heard some meditations to try to arouse greater love for him or get him uh, uh, or get closer to Jesus 
or grow your faith in him. That is not how you do it. It is through scripture. It is through prayer. An occult practice cannot be blended. It cannot be rebranded or relabeled or in any way, shape or form Christianized. Another one is yoga. Oh, it was yoga that I learned in the church. I was just talking about meditation. Um, this one is the yoga. So basically the whole point of yoga is that through relaxation, a combination of relaxation and uh, postures, uh, exercises, they look a lot like stretching exercises. They're called asanas. The whole point is to yoke with your higher self while you literally, with these poses, are offering yourself up to Hindu gods. Yoga is crafted to put you in a state of altered consciousness. It's the whole point of yoga. It doesn't matter if you are practicing just the exercises or not. They are not for Christians. You are uh, on your way to uh, an, an altered uh, state of altered consciousness in which you are supposed to be able to realize that you yourself are a god. It's an orthodox system of Hinduism, the religion. And as I just said, even the exercises on their own are not for Christians. These alone, even the exercises, can open you to possible demon possession. So how does this happen? Well, this fancy new age explanation is yoga opens one up to the kundalini serpent power to enter in and rise through the central psychic channel up the spine. Yoga is a new age occult practice, the very nature and goals of which involve the probability again of spiritualist involvement. Have I gone backwards here? No. No, excuse me, I haven't. So this is exactly the same as meditation. It opens you up. And in addition to which, I think a lot of people think and feel, look, I'm just practicing the stretches. I'm just doing the stretches. Well, I will tell you this has happened to many an innocent yoga enthusiast that they have opened themselves up to possession and become um, under possession of a demon spirit. Part of it is, um, even though you're just doing the stretches, you're still doing what it is that calls the, calls the demons in. And also, uh, inevitably, you're going to want to do more anyway. So what is yoga without some meditation? What is yoga without sitting and visualizing? That sort of thing. Other, I'll call them hard to spot, new age practices that have made their way into the Christian church. The Enneagram tool, this is a very interesting. It's called a tool for personality testing and self-discovery. Now in the back of the, uh, just behind the writing there, you can probably see that nine pointed star. So the Enneagram traces back to ancient times and classical uh, Greece. Um, it's, it's connected with true self and false self and self, self, self. This is when you take this Enneagram test or when people take this Enneagram test. They're figuring out what your true self is and then what your false self is and how that false self tends to, um, uh, you know, trip you up, trip up your true self. I mean, it's really quite something. It's all self, self, self. It's supposed to contain wisdom and divine insight. So this, uh, this thing in the back, this nine pointed star is sacred, sacred geometry. It's also a very ancient symbol. Um, it's also the symbol, uh, the primary symbol of the Baha'i faith. Um, it involves triangles and hexagons. Um, so in terms of all this new age and, and connections back to ancient occult, nine as aspects of deity nine Celtic gods, nine Egyptian gods, nine Greek muses. All of those nines come back to this star. They're represented in that star. And so the question I ask is, have you ever seen the Enneagram endorsed by God in scripture? So again, the nine pointed star is a common mathematical shape 
that consists of three intersection, uh, three intersecting triangles. And uh, in New, New Age terminology, it's a symbol of spiritual enlightenment and completion. It's also associated with the Hindu, Hindu god of creation, Brahma, who is said to have created the universe in nine days. And Brahma is part of a triple god um, uh, scenario. So clearly, uh, call it what you want, the Enneagram, the nine-pointed star, and anything to do with it, a personality test or what you will that involves self, false self, true self, is East, pagan, and new age. They should not be utilized by Christians or offered in the church to help people on their walk with Christ. Another one is the law of attraction. Um, this is this whole idea that you can attract to yourself whatever it is that you want and you can avoid the things that you don't want by creating, visualizing, seeing what it is you want in your mind's eye. Here we go back to stirring the imagination, stirring visualization, and then allowing Right at the very basic law of attraction is witchcraft and it's magic. And not in any way, shape or form should Christians get involved in this practice of the law of attraction. God decides we do not. And there's no greater fool than we think we can cause these things to happen. Now, some people deftly argue, Christians, I've heard some Christians do this, that it's based on scripture. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Sure, but however, we look at 1 John 5, 14 to 15, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. We know we have to pray in God's will. And we, as believers, strive to do that. And certainly we can ask the Lord for things to help us in our lives, to provide us with certain things, but it needs to be in his will. That's so important. Christians know that. And also this, this thing about law of attraction, you know, it's really about building your life up with things, right? So Matthew 6, 19, 21, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust do corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor, ro nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also with our Father in heaven. That's where we want to lay up our treasure. Also, these various word of faith, name it, claim it, prosperity gospels, these are all things. I don't think anybody has really ever associates these with the new age. They're pure, complete and pure new age. Hokum bokum, they've been coming in for a long time. Praying to use God to get your goals and plans for your life. It's straight up new age, straight up law of attraction, trying to drag God into the mix. There is a God who will answer your prayers here but it is not God, our Father in heaven. And I'll leave that there. There's also notions of follow your heart and believe in yourself. And so we simply need to go to Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 7. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and leave uh, not, lean, I think it should be not, unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Need we say any more? We are to trust in the Lord with all our heart. There's also these uh, uh, classes, these Ignatian spiritual exercises, which I'm to understand have also been adopted in churches that are not uh, uh, Roman Catholic or associated uh, in any way with that. 
uh, directly, like specifically with that. So these, uh, they're known as soul streams. So here's a quote about that. By engaging with scripture and prayer and with exercises of the imagination called meditations and contemplations, the spiritual exercises help the retreatant to consider who they are for God and who God is for them. God is the same. This is my statement. God is the same for everyone and does not differ from person to person. Yes, our relationship, our blessed relationship with our Father in heaven is a very personal one, but he is the same God for every single person. Meditation and visualization, New Age, East, paganism. That's what that's all about. Here's another one, uh, another quote. The exercises are good for increasing one's openness to the movement of the spirit for bringing to light hindrances within us that may obstruct one's attunement to the spirit and their truest self. There's one of those true self, truest self, self-humanism, new age. So here's just a pretty quick listing of other New Age practices done in the Christian church. You probably recognize a lot of these. Anything secret sensitive, it is, it is. It compromises scripture, compromises the gospel to bring people in, to get the crowds in. This whole notion of all roads lead to heaven. Again, ecumenism, New Age. Um, praying to the angels, praying to saints. Uh, anything to do with self-improvement, positive mental attitude, realizing your potential. This is all intricately connected with new age. Anything touted to help you live a more successful Christian life. Only God can, can be a part of your walk and bring you into better step with him. Anything outside of you or a course or some kind of class or devotion that is to help you live a more successful Christian life, I urge you to stay away from it. Uh, healing ministries um, just are teaching prophecy, tongues, or how to develop a gift from God. Only God can do that within us. We don't need somebody else to teach us prophecy. I mean, there are whole ministries built around these things. Um, and then just straight up going quiet and within to listen for God's voice. I know so many people who are full on, bang on, new age practitioners today. That is exactly how their journey started. Going within, quietly, listening for God's voice, hearing a voice, hearing it again, and then eventually being led down the garden path into the new age. God is the giver of all. No new age techniques or teachings needed. They only take you away from God. They incite him to anger and cause him to turn away and to turn you over. Participating in new age practices is spiritual adultery. So now we're on to question four. How do we do battle with the new age occult in our church? Well, I like to keep things simple when I can. So I'm calling these the four R's. Believers need to recognize, research, repent, and reprove. So recognize. Basically, something that's either brought to your attention or perhaps going on in your church. Could be the offering of an Enneagram test. It could be a series of devotions that are, you know, things that I've been, been talking about, examples um, that I've been trying and hoping to put in front of you. Endeavor to see that, that practice or that class or the matter, whatever it might be, for what it is. Endeavor to get clear about it. Make that your goal. And if it is being pointed out to you, and it really doesn't matter who or how, you know, as a believer, that the Holy Spirit will put things in front of you in all kinds of ways. 
once this happens for you, recognize that the Holy Spirit is alerting you to it. And then you're going to commit to take further steps with prayer for guidance. God will, with your commitment, your wanting to know through him, God will get you where he wants you to be. You've got to resolve to find out God's truth on the matter. And then to help yourself, it's really important to research, to understand. You want to become informed on the practice or the matter. So um, let's say that there's a, you know, I, just a random example. There are a series of devotionals being offered. And based on what you've heard tonight, you go back and you listen. And it's starting to be like, uh-oh, that doesn't sound good. I kind of tapped into that information the other night. Okay, so research to learn what you can about it. Listen to the words. Look into, if it happens to involve visuals, the signs, the symbols. What's being said? What's being conveyed? What are you being asked to do? Those sorts of things. Also, talk to others who know, who happen to know more about it, to hear what they have to say. So for example, I'll use myself as an example. I know a lot about the new age. I can, would be happy always to share, to answer questions. You may know other people in your life who, who would, would be able to be that same person for you. But the key thing is do all you can to see it clearly, prayerfully with the guidance of Holy Spirit. Um, so my website is meant to be a resource uh, for exactly that sort of thing. I explore and call out New Age practices on my website, clairvoyancetochrist.com. In terms of words, which I've put in red up above, I'm going to take you into some examples of symbols in a second here. But there is an A to Z list of New Age words and practices. And there are some articles and videos. I've just begun um, my ministry. So I'm constantly working behind the scenes to build up content to help believers and to help New Age practitioners. So that it's a growing catalog of that information. Um, there's videos with information, articles, and um, other things to help educate and inform. So when I say symbols, I mean these sorts of things. You know, you you might see a symbol on something. So note it if if you net if you notice it, note it. So these are some like the enneagram is in that top left hand corner there. You've got Eastern symbols, yin yang. You've got pyramids with all seeing eyes. The red cross is. It's a new age occult symbol. It is that is not a, 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 anything to do with Christianity, with with being a believer. Peace signs, pentagrams, uh, uh, multi pointed stars on the right. All kinds. Whenever you see these swirls and things, uh, uh, onks, moons and stars, these are all um, Wicca, Wicca, Wicca. Um, goddess worship symbols. So these are things, especially now, like, you know, if you have a blue Honda, you see the blue Hondas. Now that you've seen these, you may notice them. These are symbols that communicate to people who know what they are, basically. Learn what you can. I'm not saying go overboard. Just be able to say, okay, that's a new age symbol and this is why. And again, these are some of them too. You can see chakras, the, the gentleman, black gentleman standing there with the colors going up the spine. You can see meditation. You can see visualization, um, unity with the hands joining together, um, planets uh, for astrology, pointed stars, popes, hats, crystals, yin, yang. These are all symbols that are all over the place in the world. Um, if these... It, are hooked up with things you're looking at, make a note and see what you can learn about it. Then the other R after research is repent, which simply means change your mind about it. Renew your mind in scripture. If you have um, done the other and you've researched and you've looked at it and then you know now, okay, this isn't good. This is not good. Then, uh, 
you can repent. You change your mind about it. Measure, prove, check against scripture. What does God say? This is part of re renewing our minds in scripture. Take the time to search the scriptures for God's truth. Reprove. Review scripture. Um, know how to reprove, how it's done by believers. Very important to review that and understand that. See and seize the opportunity that God has put before you on the mission field. The opportunity to inform your church and possibly learn something together as a fellowship. Okay? Be prepared to speak. Be prepared with your research, your resources, and scripture. If your church is um, uh, hosting or holding or offering uh, meditation classes, this is the mission field. You need to speak. You need to approach in whatever way that, you know, God leads you to do it, to speak about this, because it should not be there. That should not be happening in the church. Um, by speaking, by doing these things, you are in God's will, and therefore you will be and are in his hands. Do not let the spirit of doubt win. Do not let Satan take control. Be in constant prayer about this. You are dealing with a new age practice in your church and likelihood as you are, it's time to speak about it. We must never be afraid to stand up for what's right and call out the new age in the Christian church. And the reason for that is only harm comes from remaining quiet. We need to know that we have to plant seeds of truth, whatever the result. If we are rejected, that's the result. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen, but it doesn't matter. It, it's separate and apart from the outcome. We must trust God to do what he will do with those seeds. We cannot know what he's going to do. We just know we have to speak. Being a believer, I like to say, is not a spectator sport. It's not a sit on the sidelines proposition. I don't care who you are, <laughs> where you are in your life. Uh, believers take action. When they know they take action, informing and calling out these practices in love and in kindness, in being informed, in knowing, being prepared with scripture. You're not going into this alone. You are Jesus is there with you, the word and the Holy Spirit, and you're in your father's will. 2 Timothy 2, 24, 25, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach patience. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Okay. Anybody who's participating, any believer who's participating in the new age practice is opposing him or herself. Timothy's tell us, step up, um, gently teach, gently point out in meekness, instruct. New age in the churches is serious stuff. We've gone through the history. We know what the end game is as far as Satan is concerned. We know that there is this concerted effort and has been for many years to infiltrate the church and it is happening. It is absolutely happening and has been for some time. If believers are not going to reprove it, who is going to reprove it? We are commanded to warn in Ezekiel 8, 18, which says, when I say unto the wicked, you shall surely die and you do not warn him nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand. That's pretty serious stuff. God's saying, if I've told him and you don't, that's not good. Those you warn may not even know that they are involved in evil or that it's a cult. This is so important to even keep in your mind. There may be, there, there likely are. Everybody probably doesn't know. And there may be people who actually God is trying to put you in front of them to open their eyes. Try and look at it that way. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, 
for instruction in righteousness. When you've got your scripture with you, you've got everything you need. We must stand for our Lord and Savior who gave his life blood for our sins. Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The new age is the wiles of the devil. The bar is high for believers. Once we truly know Jesus, we have no excuses. He is our example. The apostles are our example. We are to be of one accord with those we fellowship with. We fellowship with Acts 1.14. When there is something like this going on in the church, when your pastor is offering or the whatever, or you know, part of the church is offering meditation or a new age practice, this isn't being of one accord. This you need to be brought back into accord. We are to press toward the mark, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We have a job here to do on earth. Believers have no excuses. Um, uh, Philippians, Philippians 3.14. The least we can do is speak out and call out these practices in our church. Philippians 3.16.19. Nevertheless, to where we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly uh, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So all this new age is earthly stuff. These are pretty strong, strong um, uh, guidances from Paul Stand for your family, stand for yourself, stand for the children, stand for your church, discern and stand. And I'm hoping I've given you, you know, a good start here on how to recognize these. What are we to do? We're to overcome Revelation 2 and 3 as Christ overcame Revelation 3.21. We are to be ready for Christ's return and not in slumber or be without oil in our lamp, Matthew 25, 1 to 12. We are to watch and keep our garments, Revelation 16, 15. We are to study, to show ourselves approved so we are not ashamed, 2 Timothy 2, 15. We are to watch and pray so that we don't fall into temptation. There's a whole bunch there. Um, the watch and pray, watch, 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 uh, ending there with 1 Peter 4, 7. We are to remember that the return of our Lord could happen at any time, and we are to be ready. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, and we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. If we push back on something that God has put in front of us, and we know that we're supposed to speak, that's grieving the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. The new age is Satan's most brilliant way of lulling believers in to sleep. Do not fall for it. Do not tolerate your church falling for it. Matthew 21, 12, 13. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Is your church robbing its people? Please say no. And that is what I've got to share with you tonight. Well, thank you, Claire. That was great. Uh, we could break that down into a lot of different things and have a lot of deeper discussions on those. We sure yeah. could. <laughs> yeah. So a few comments from people watching here. And let's see. Uh, Sharon says, Satan transforming himself into an angel of light, deceiving, if possible, the very elect. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's very true. That's very true. That's what's going on. Um, so Meryl asked, what are your thoughts on breathing and relaxation techniques for pregnant women? Back in the 80s, that was... Uh, it was a big thing to take a group class. <laughs> That's my thought, Meryl. Um, yeah. I wouldn't it's, say there's per se anything. I mean, if you're just 
taking a, you know, a, a deep breath, you know, in through your nose, out sure. through your mouth. It's not like you're sitting there in a class and everybody's breathing and you're trying to get into some sort of whatever, you know, meditation. Right. Okay. So one of the things to just be really cautious and, and cognizant of is that this can lead to other things. That's where mm -hmm. the big, huge caution is. Um, so breathing and relaxing, um, and it feels good, right? So it really worked for this and boy, oh boy, you know, I had a, hot, a tough pregnancy and the breathing and relaxation really helped then. Well, you know, wonder if it would work for this and work for that. So this is, this is the, the hallmark is that it is going to lead to other things. Um, if somebody is doing that with absolute clarity about what could possibly happen and the conviction that they aren't going to go any further, that could be a different thing. Um, I just, I'm extremely cautious because I've seen so much of it and I've experienced so much of it in my own life and with people I know that, that I err on the side of, of caution. Well, and like you said, that's where it can lead somewhere else. So if it's in the classroom, if it's in the church you know, or with the young people, it may not initially be the evil where it can go, but you don't know what they're going to go research online and look this up. Oh, this was cool. We did it with a pastor and they think it's okay because it was okay there. And then they're deceived going mm -hmm. further yep. down. So that's where um, you got to be really careful. Um, yeah. Sharon, other Sharon asks us, did you ever look into pyramids and the powers that they have or supposedly have? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was a period in my time in the new age when I did quite a bit of looking into the pyramids, pyramids and the whole Egyptian thing and the whole history and all of that. Um, so the answer is yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't, you know, in a, you know, I think Sharon, you know that my my position on all of this is that it's power is given to to those who imbue the power to it, right? And any power that comes through something like that is demonic power. It's demonic mm -hmm. evil spirits that are influencing the whole deal. So yes, I did, and that's one of the reasons why I included that uh, symbol in the uh, in that page of symbols there. Just a quick go by. Um, it is a deep, very ancient occult symbol. And, and, you know, the thing is, you look around, you probably see them all the time, especially if it's something you're asking about, Sharon, but they're all over the place. You see them all over the place. So there's mm -hmm. a ton I could say about that, but I won't, I won't go into it tonight. <laughs> right, right. And Laureen says, wow, wow, wow. Yep. <laughs> people are listening what you're just not aware of you know all well and that's the thing it, it is light it, looks how so light. How it sounds good i was taking that. some notes that it's not all evil on the outside They're, you know you're doing good things it's peace personal growth like you've shared in other uh presentations that you thought you were helping people when Absolutely. you were doing what you did and you know just you know it's for health and it sounds christian uh, or they use the word church, or like you said, Messiah. Um, even that one lady who labored her, labeled herself as a Christian, uh, Alice mm -hmm. Bailey. Um, mm -hmm. So just because someone calls himself a Christian or says it's a church event, um, you need to be careful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's why I call it love, light, and lies. It's it's right, right. It's deception. Um, yeah. We're not going to keep people on too much longer. I did have a couple Understood. comments though myself. Um, so I, I really appreciated one thing you said, we need to mark, avoid and call out. So I mean, obviously, you do that in love and out of love. Always. But yeah. if, if we're not doing that, because we don't want to hurt someone's feelings, or what will they think of us? You know, maybe we can turn around and walk away from that and not be affected by it. But there's so many people sitting in there, especially young people, and mm -hmm. don't realize that this door is just getting open wider and wider and wider. Yeah. And like you mentioned with the yoga, you may not think you're doing it or games mm -hmm. that you play, but you're calling out to the demons to come in. And yeah. just because you're not saying demon come in, doesn't mean that door is not open if you're doing things that open those doors. 
Yep, that's exactly the design of these things. Um, it is, uh, you know, I also talked about the signs and the, the secret little words and things. Well, that's what you're doing with, mm -hmm. with the demonic realm. You mm -hmm. are participating. You have stepped into, another way that I say it is, you have stepped out of God's jurisdiction into Satan's jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you've left, you've left, you know, the street and stepped into the donut shop <laughs> and now you're, you know, you got to follow the rules there. Right. Right. I'm, right. Being, I'm being silly, but you get my point. It's, right. it's and just by the very action. Yeah. Yes. And you said that at the beginning that the new age has a task to, has a task and to finish it. They want to finish it. They want to oh, finish yes. it too. So you said that they are clear in their purpose and their goals. So we see mm -hmm. that our, our topic to, you know, this weekend is finish the task. Um, they have a task and they're wanting to finish it and they have clear goals and purpose. So my question is for us, individuals and as ministries or churches, do we have a clear purpose and do we have goals towards finishing the task that we are supposed to have? I don't think we should be left behind in that. I mean, they're out doing it and they've got their purpose and their goals. Yeah. And they're clearly working toward it. You know, what are we doing? Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely a question so. that we each, each of us needs to be asking ourselves. And the beautiful thing is that this is part of what I'm hoping will be a takeaway. It's I'm not saying it's easy. It's never easy to, to speak on these things. It's hard. <laughs> But if God's putting it in front of us, there's a task. That's part of our task then, right? And God is so um, gracious and wonderful in that he does this for us. He puts something right in front of us. And then from there, we get to step in. But of course, we have our, you know, we've got our free will. Um, so our, 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 ta our finishing our task may be just a bunch of little tasks, you know, that that God is putting before us each and every day to, mm -hmm. to walk Christ in and, and bring in the light. And um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you to go to clairvoyance to Christ and check out um, all those interesting articles there. Also the list we put together um, as she mentioned earlier, do some research, but you don't have to get so into it that you're getting mm -hmm. drugged down the rabbit hole yourself yeah uh, but you need to be aware of things and um yeah i thank you for the work that you're doing we'll end here with a couple uh thank yous from our dear sisters here thank you claire thank from you, sharon Karen. and um shelly says so very blessed to have claire vice thank versa you. yeah <laughs> Um, thank you for all your hard work on this presentation. We're blessed to have you as one of our sisters. That's Nancy. I'm blessed. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Shelly says, yeah. you, Lori and Sharon, and she just is yeah. going on and on. Yeah. Uh, very eye opening. And thank you. So oh, I, my, thank you, Lori Jane. Yeah. So I, I thank you as well, um, Claire. And I thank everybody uh, for joining us tonight. And hopefully we'll see you all back here tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Yeah. And our speaker is going to be Dan Gill, uh, speaking to those confused with Kelvin, uh, Kelvin's teachings. Uh, Shelly's mm -hmm. going to be on, our own Shelly. Yeah. And she's going to be sharing her testimony and speaking to former Watchtower followers or Jehovah's Witnesses and her experience trying to help those who are still in and how she's tried to uh, be a sort of a lighthouse for those who are waking up and maybe wanting to come out. And our third speaker will be Joe Martin, and he will be sharing about his recent, recent missions trip to Africa. They haven't been over there for quite a while uh, with COVID and everything else going on. And so they were there three months in two different trips uh, this past summer. So that will be fun to take a look at what he has to share. And again, we're going to be having a drawing for this mug on uh, Saturday and Shema and also this tumbler. So join us. We will have a drawing and you just might be one of the lucky winners there. I put in the uh, chat there uh, the schedule you can find at kogmissions.com online 2023. And when this is all over, you can watch the individual replays 
there from each of the speakers. They will be listed there. So Claire, thanks so much. Do you have a final word as we say goodnight? Gosh, you know, I think I've said quite a bit and I'm so grateful for, for those who stuck around and stayed with it because that's a lot to absorb. Um, thank, thank you, Sharon. Um, uh, just, you know, just um, our, our God is a good God and let's just do what we can when he puts it in front of us. And if I can ever be of any support or answer any questions, I'm happy to do so. Um, and, and they can find your email address at clairvoyance to christ.com there. Uh, you know what? I'm going to add that. I don't think I've put that on there, but I'm going right. to do it. Mm -hmm. I will get that on there. And I'm always happy to give that to, out to anybody who wants it anyway. So. Mm -hmm.